Hello. Thank you for being very patient while I run around like an idiot, like I do most of my live streams. So this should be normal for anybody who knows me. It's okay. I, I've come to uh, like accept this as being on brand <laughs> for Mac 84. So I'm Steve from the Mac 84 YouTube channel. This is my good pal Ron. Hey everybody. Ron's computer videos. Yeah, something like that. Did you did you bring a postcard to throw yeah. endlessly into the group? <laughs> no. Oh, last time I did that, I gave somebody a terminal paper cut. <laughs> oh, so yeah. I just. Uh, Trying to keep the lawsuits to one or fewer at this VCF Midwest. Well, so. it's, I mean, you almost got served the other day. But. It's true. Yeah, it was cool. But it was cool to meet, um, you know, that lady from that movie in the 90s. That it, you got to remember her name for the joke to make sense. But Swing and a miss. So we're yeah. off to a good start. So we're going to be talking about Macintosh clones. And yes. uh, we'll be going over a little bit of the history of that. Uh, there will probably be some heckling and typos from our good pal James from across the pond, who's uh, patiently looking at me to be like, what is he going to mistype or mispronounce? Mm -hmm. Because he is, he is one of my, my experts on uh, the subject. But this is a weird period in Apple's history that I have to speak closer to the microphone because I don't know mm -hmm. how to, this works. Um, but it was a weird period in Apple's history where they actually allowed other companies to make Mac-compatible machines. So Steve, we're going to be talking a little that, bit about that this. that Apple was like, we're going to sell more computers by selling fewer computers. Yes. <laughs> it's, we just need more Macs out there. I mean, we don't need to necessarily make any money off of them, but... <laughs> so What's who, money? Yeah, exactly. So who are you? Uh, I'm Steve. I, I do the Mac 84 stuff on the YouTubes. Hi, Steve. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Ronald? you. Ronald? Well. Yes, I think this is our first time. It's something like that. <laughs> something like that. So yeah. you, could, you could find us on the social medias and the YouTubes things, and that's what we do. That's what we look like when we're not sweaty and running around. That's right. So we have this little QR code here. It goes to mac84.net forward slash start. There's a bunch of stuff related to like getting started on the Mac, and also uh, there will be a link to this presentation and some other Mac clone stuff. So this will also be at the end of the deck, and you can just go to the website if you remember it. If you forget, just find us and yell at us, and we will tell you. Yeah, or just find us and yell at us. It's fine. It's okay. We're used to it at this point. <laughs> So would you like to go over the, the list that you're reading of what we're going to be talking about? Yeah, today? absolutely. So uh, the, kind of the scope of this talk this evening is going to be to kind of discuss what classifies as a Macintosh clone. We'll talk a brief history about the cloning or the, the cloning program. <laughs> I have to get Saifo Diaz out here. Uh, <laughs> we'll have a, a brief discussion of Apple's clone program, uh, machines to avoid, uh, kind of our favorite clones, and... Um, you know, what could have been with the program, and then we'd love to hear your guys' questions. Yes. Just just don't let the Jedi Council know we're talking about clones. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Big no-no. <laughs> All right. So what the heck is a Macintosh clone anyway? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as I mentioned, for a brief period in the 90s, Apple did allow other companies to manufacture Mac OS compatible clones. Obviously, this is something they would never do today, uh, but they, it was a very different time period. And we're going to go back in history before we talk a bit about this, but like, the reason behind this was the Mac was a very different platform. You have to set your minds back to 84 and the systems that were around then, even before then. And what were some of the advantages that the Mac had over like your standard PC or some system where there was not really too much to go with on the screen other than text. So it was one of these things where, yes, it was expensive. Yes, it was fairly limited in the first iteration, but it was something that a lot of folks saw the potential of and they wanted it on the pie. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Since uh, kind of the inception of Apple, um, the uh, especially with the Apple II machines, Microsoft was kind of one of those key partners. And when they heard that they had robbed Xerox first, they decided that they wanted in on that sweet, sweet money as well. Yes. So Bill Gates pressured um, Apple into licensing or, or wanted to try to pressure him to licensing certain aspects of the Mac OS uh, to Microsoft. And um, you know, Apple or after the Apple II was originally cloned, um, it was it was basically it's like you know why not the Mac? Why why can't we do some of these other things as well? Yeah, yeah, and it was it was something that you know I don't think Apple was like happy with the Apple II cloning program because there yeah. were plenty of court cases and mm -hmm. famous imagery online of like the hacked and stolen screens and stuff right. like that. Mm -hmm. But it was something that was like more common of that period of time for the systems that were available. And so Ron is a bit happy about this slide because I know, I know you've never seen this before in your life. So no, you're gonna have I, to, I'm you're completely <laughs> unfamiliar with this book that I slept with under my pillow for about 
eight years when I was a teenager. <laughs> it's, Memorize cover to cover. Right. Parents are knocking on the door. What are you doing in there? I'm not reading Build a Mac and Save a Fortune either, Mom. It's fine. <laughs> but what was interesting is if, if you saw some ads in the back of a magazine, mm -hmm. there were things, uh, I think one of them was called Cat Mac, correct? Yeah. yeah, actually, well, that was kind of Or the, that was like the, the that, was, that was the idea. So there's this really cool book that came out when I was a teenager that was called Build Your Own Macintosh and Save a Bundle. And it went through a couple of revisions over the years where the idea was is you were somehow like one of the one of these magic kids like you were one of these people that had access to like um a, a warehouse full of apple parts that you could take <laughs> put in a generic pc case and then basically have yourself a mac and the idea was it was you were going through the catalog and ordering parts uh like okay this generic floppy drive works with this machine this yeah. generic hard drive i can use this paper white 12 inch monitor uh, with um, like my Macintosh uh, uh, SE. So, so that way that I could have a, a big screen for um, my word processing or whatever. So these catalog Macs kind of inspired other people to be like, well, why, why don't we just make a nice engineered solution that it's, it's a nice case with, with smooth edges and, and it doesn't just look like a PC clone. And that's why we've got these companies um, that we're going to talk about this evening that kind of decided to get in on this while the getting was still good. Yeah. So there, there were some loopholes at the time, like you could order logic boards or ROMs as like service parts from Apple, and they didn't really require that you return them immediately, or there was some grace period, or mm -hmm. there were shenanigans going on where like, oh, I forgot to send the ROMs back, and now I could just put this in this little PCB or this daughter card mm -hmm. that's like hand soldered, and oops. Now I have a Macintosh workalike machine that's 100% compatible with the software because it's using Apple's ROMs. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of things maybe on the Amiga and other platforms too, which I'm sure folks are familiar with, where it was a, basically a interface card that had Mac ROMs on it. So you could, since they also use Motorola processors, that you could run these other applications. But they were like, I really want that look and feel because Apple kind of has a certain design language, and a certain way that they do the products. And so they were like, we got to get in there. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there was this whole scene. There was multiple volumes of these books. There's some very interesting projects I've seen here at East, at, at Midwest, and all the other uh, functions that you know have a lot of these cool things that people bring to di for display. But like some of these systems are very handmade. You could tell oh, like, yeah. oh, there's five different shades of plastic on the front, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, but there, there were also like some of the more refined ones. So um, Apple didn't have any portable systems at the time. So folks like Kobe, uh, who did a lot of reverse engineering and, and stuff for the original IBM PC, uh, had a series of different Macs. And this is a great image of one of their first ones with the MacBook Air next to it. Mm -hmm. I think it's an 11 inch, so it's, it's a little bit of a dramatic thing, but that thing's a luggable. Um, but I mean, Although it's so huge and cumbersome looking, there are actually like a few interesting innovations in there. They had hot swappable-ish like drive trays, like you could shut down the machine, pull out this tray on this little connector, and you could shove a, a floppy disk drive in or a hard drive or something. They were expensive, but there was no other option for a portable Mac. There were no luggables, there were no laptops officially provided by Apple. So, you know, Kobe and Outbound and Dynamac, I think was another one of them. They all provided these solutions where it was like, yeah, it's basically a Mac Plus or a Mac SE in some sort of suitcase form factor. Yeah, and I, I seem to remember some of those early examples you can find pictures of online very much just have like pian uh, piano hinge sort yeah. of on the back of the display. So they were using a lot of off-the-shelf parts to try to bridge the gap and get these things going. Um, I think... Uh, like the one on the right there even had like a gas plasma display yes. that was yeah. uh, like Grid or another company was producing at the time. So they were these were prohibitively expensive uh, just because some of the innovations to get things smaller and smaller and smaller had to immediately be um, sourced from competitors that yeah. would price things to try to keep those markets small and slowly growing, if growing at all. Yeah, and, and what's really interesting is like some of these, they start out very crude, but like the outbound systems, they develop technology where you could basically have like expandable displays and stuff like that. 
And, you know, when eventually things got into hot water with Apple, they made deals of like, hey, we'll, we'll give you the license or we'll sell you this technology and you could probably use this in something else. And they eventually did with like the PowerBook Duo series and stuff like that. But I mean, a lot of this stuff was very innovative. You see these original ads for these machines and it's like a, a three uh, page or a brochure type thing. And you see like the, the outbound laptop, which is the one on the left in this picture or, or a similar one. And then there's like a Mac SE desktop. And it was like, oh, you could expand, you know, the, the way this works. And, you know, just like you wouldn't have that from any portable Mac manufacturer, especially since Apple wasn't making, you know, comparable systems up until yeah. I think it was uh, when the portable come out at 89 or something like that. It's pretty yeah. late. It was yeah. Yeah. the luggable. I'm sorry. It's the luggable. <laughs> yes. Um, but there weren't just portables and James mm -hmm. would recognize this photo. Um, <laughs> Other companies were like, hey, let's take like an Apple logic board, but let's put it in a bigger case. Let's mm -hmm. give it some more expandability. Let's give it some bells and whistles and stuff like that. And so this is a, a Dash 30 FX, which is basically an accelerated Macintosh 2 FX. And I'm looking at James so he could wag his finger if I'm wrong. Um, but you have a boatload of more expansion slots in there for your drives. I mean, just like, what is there, like 8,000 of them? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. So their own accelerators, their own RAM, and their own SCSI to like pour every ounce of power out of this thing. And, and how many pounds of this way? <laughs> wow. So heavy steel. steel. Yeah. yeah. Their own so power supply. probably have to. That weighs but half of the size of the machine. All I can say is I'm glad that they targeted the 2FX because that machine was around for, what, six months? <laughs> it's, you know, so by right the time they got the design and everything finalized, Apple was already off to the next thing. <laughs> So these, these machines by Kobe and Outbound, they were around for a few years, but ultimately they didn't last long. Um, Apple closed some of the loopholes that they had for their service parts. You know, you had to return things. Um, and eventually, you know, they had their own portable, which was the, the Macintosh portable, which was okay. I mean, it solved the problem of having an official Apple portable, but um, it was not really lightweight. I mean, it was, it was lighter than a Macintosh Plus and a bit more convenient, but yeah. the PowerBook really just killed that. So, you know, you, talk, you look at the timeline of these things and like so much is happening so frequently with so much innovation mm -hmm. that it's very clear to see like in hindsight, oh yeah, they should have just like waited a while while they miniaturized things. But also it was like the development of these projects where they figured out like, all right, well, how much hard disk can people get away with? How much battery life can we support? Mm -hmm. And the technology is a lot of sustaining that battery life with a, a screen that may be backlit with right. a hard disk mm -hmm. that could spin down to save you precious minutes when you're working on your presentation mm -hmm. but it was kind of nice because um, this uh, clone industry in the early days before Apple's official clone program goosed them and had them moving forward uh, whereas before they'd been kind of stagnant and there had even been sort of talk about like well, when is this when is the portable Macintosh coming and there was, there was just nothing because there was no push to really get something out there in the market. So Apple dropped this boat anchor on us and of the Mac Portable, and it was really, really neat. But that was also through that process they were able to develop partnerships with Sony and, yep. and other manufacturers that were already um, kind of on that cutting edge for miniaturization. <laughs> and had the uh, ability to spin up some of that manufacturing capacity. So if you're familiar with the Power, or the PowerBook 100, that's basically, they handed that to Sony and said, make it small, <laughs> you know? Make it not break my back when I yes, pick it up. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but also at this time, you know, Apple wasn't doing well financially, which is a repeatable trend in the 90s. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, a lot of the folks who were, you know, going to buy Macintosh because, oh, it's, it's the system that's easy to use. Well, you know, the, the other fo folks that were making computers weren't standing still. You know, you had better GUI in DOS shells and, and Windows and things like that that were on the horizon or had been released. And businesses thought, well, maybe this is good enough. And once you get those into businesses and schools, well, that's what I'm used to already. So when it's time for me to have a reason to buy a personal computer, like, oh, well, maybe I'm going to stray this way or that way. Yeah. And so um, around this time, you know, a lot goes on. I have a video that goes into deeper details about this, but I thought, you know, good to preface some of this stuff before we get to the official clone program. But um, there were a lot of discussions in the early 90s, a lot of internal power struggles between, 
know, different folks with different plans of seeing the writing on the wall of like, look, our Motorola processors that we're getting from this company are only getting a little bit better here and there. And these systems, you know, we could add color, we could shoehorn color onto this, mm -hmm. or we could shoehorn this capability onto that. And it was just like the, the Mac OS was getting a bit like finicky, yeah. <laughs> um, especially, you know, before the system seven days that helped unify some things, but they were basically patching the OS to meet the compatibility of the system that was coming out mm -hmm. and not really a lot of time for global rewrites and you sure. know future focusing on on other things so i mean this this sort of culminates uh in the let's say around like 93 94 a lot of uh discussions going on with apple a lot of uh john scully and michael spindler you know just beating each other to death with baseball bats. That's, you know, just a dramatization, of course. Uh, so. <laughs> I was going to say, there, I don't think there's any actual footage of this. <laughs> we just but, get an uh, AI image, put yeah, it up there, right. and everyone will believe it. It's, yeah, fine. it's fine. Why does John Scully have seven fingers on each hand? <laughs> you know what? That's what Pepsi will do to you. <laughs> so there, there were a lot of discussions of, like, how to get the Macintosh market share up, because obviously you had these... PCs at much cheaper prices and mm -hmm. businesses were just, you know, buying whatever was affordable. If it was good enough, you know, we would take that on. Right. And the thing was that, you know, you could either, oh, well, let's let's have the Mac OS go on to an Intel platform. Let's start a project with that. And there were plenty of internal projects that started and stopped. Um, but there were also calls to say like, well, hey, let's, you know, have manufacturing help. Let's get other companies here to build Macs. And it would expand this market share, not seeing, you know, the writing on the wall, but obviously. I mean, I kind of <laughs> joked about where it was like that there's just more Macs out there. Yeah. That the kind of this the, the idea, it's a very pure and, and and sort of good idea, which is if there's more people out there making Macs, um, Apple as a company and their partners only had so much uh, manufacturing capacity to get things done. If you could work with other people and their other partners and uh, leverage um, their manufacturing operations that's more things in the market and more machines is going to drive more software and more software is going to yeah. drive, drive more development and then more people and then maybe some people will buy these lesser machines and at a later time we'll be able to say well you can have a Packard Bell but wouldn't you really like to have the Cadillac of whatever this experience is yeah yeah, um, yeah. and that, so at this point in time you know all the 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 processors were the 68K, you know, series of 68,000 series of processors. And Apple wasn't really like 100% satisfied with the gains that they were making from Motorola at the time. And they were shopping around different chip vendors, different ways that they could fabricate their own. And eventually these discussions would come uh, also in the form factor of like Scully and Spindler were like, well, it'd be great if like some big company could just buy us and like yeah. license us or put mm -hmm. us out of its mis our misery and we'll just, you know, write a golden parachute. We'll be fine, you know. Um, so there a lot of these talks going on and some of these eventually led to discussions with IBM. And so eventually, you know, it would be announced that Apple would, would switch to IBM's PowerPC line of chips. Uh, I think it was the Power uh, series or the Power One series mm -hmm. or whatever the, the original uh, architecture was that it was based on. But a lot of engineering went into it to see, like, can we, like, emulate older programs or no, it'll just be a clean slate. You won't be able to use the old stuff and a lot of back and forth. So th this went on for a few years. Um, but the thing is that, you know, Apple as a company wasn't, you know, too big at the time. And if you think of like Apple going to, let's say, Motorola or IBM or another manufacturer to get sourcing and parts, they didn't really have the pull that they do today of like, we need you to manufacture this at X specs at this percent of reliability for this price. And they just didn't have that clout. So partnering up with another company like IBM or Motorola would give them that clout. And so part of this whole AIM Alliance thing, and there were these you know, supposed uh, platforms and, and specifications that they were all drafting, and this was going to be like the, the wave of the future for things, you know, prelim pre pre preliminary plans for, you know, IBM to use the same platform. So theoretically, you know, you could run Mac OS on, you know, any PowerPC box that you would buy. And of course, a lot of this stuff fizzled out, you know, as things went on. But there was a lot of hope for this. And a lot of like, press was was busied up about this like oh my gosh like this is a, a huge thing I mean, you think about like companies making alliances these days like oh and made the news but like for apple to go with like a former you know enemy big blue you know really? that was yeah. a pretty big shocker people were really upset about that but this was really a banner time to work for apple if your job was to make press releases <laughs> because <laughs> 
I, I'm not saying in my mind there's like there's everybody is in there they're typing away it's like a 1940s newsroom and John Scully would kind of kick the door open and, all right everybody here's the latest update we're gonna run them on toasters yeah that's right we're gonna break into the breakfast market <laughs> Syrup will cost fifty dollars extra. Right. <laughs> yeah. So here, just uh, some news clippings from the time and, and things like that. But you know, the, this the, the September date is when uh, they announced the uh, intention to license the Macintosh clones. The newspaper is obviously from 1991, but we're fast forwarding to 1994 because otherwise we'll talk about this stuff forever. I can also tell by this graphic that this newspaper was desperate not to be sued by <laughs> Apple. <laughs> they were. So they were just, they just described it over the phone if using artful euphemism, what if, the Apple logo looks like. If, if your apples look like this, please call 1-800. <laughs> <laughs> so what's in a Macintosh clone? So this is the official program that Apple started to license. So uh, uh, you'll see a lot of press releases in those 1994 errors of like, oh, it's going to be this, it's going to be that, it's going to be this. Uh, and Apple was themselves just getting into these PowerPC chips. So they had like the 6100 series, mm -hmm. the 7100, and so on. And so they were they were just starting out. You know, there was still the Nubus architecture and yeah, all that mm -hmm. fun stuff. Um, but essentially what a Macintosh uh, clone boils down to, it's a compatible Mac with a logic board either made by Apple or approved by Apple that had uh, modifications made by other companies. And what was interesting is those manufacturers were sort of thinking to the future of like, if we're going to build this PCB, we'll just like add a bunch of extra pads or slots or things mm -hmm. later where we could easily modify without having to remanufacture this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And what was cool about that is you had the addition of on some clones like IBM PS2 ports for keyboards and mice mm -hmm. and spots or, where you could or put HD 15 yeah, instead yeah. of Apple's DB 15. For no, the no more adapters. Video. I know it's amazing. <laughs> Um, but there were also like uh, plans that oh you could you know just if the if these uh, clone manufacturers decided to if the prices fluctuated or whatever you could put you know IBM standard floppy drive headers on there you know PC yeah. compatible mm -hmm. uh, chipsets or whatever and we'll just use a standard PC drive and maybe some software wizardry to yeah. read you know Mac disks and that'll be good enough. You yeah, know? the uh, the power supplies are even sort of the the precursor for ATX. It's oh yeah, L LPX. Is that the kind of what the uh, that we're, interim we're Mac standard people, was? We don't understand. Yeah, it's um, but yeah, it was sort of a an interim power supply standard between uh, the AT style power supply and the um, the ATX style power supply that even saw many or even saw use by other manufacturers like Dell and IBM and stuff. Yeah. So they were they were really thinking of how can we get the cost down on some of these core components, um, like you were saying, like MFM hard drives instead of the whatever whatever the um the apple uh standard is for kind of the floppy controllers oh the, yeah 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 so it's just how can we get the cost down on all every this? penny we could say <laughs> yes and and make this as easy and cheap for people to manufacture so that we can get the licensing fee f off the difference yeah yeah, and, and a lot of these shortcuts required some compromise uh, with the user experience. So maybe the CD-ROM drive was not an Apple ROM CD-ROM drive, so you needed some software like FBW's Hard Disk Toolkit or CD-ROM Toolkit to actually like properly read those drives, or like it would like only work half the time. If you, right. every other boot, you know, mm -hmm. cycle and a blue moon, you know, all this stuff. Um, but they would also bundle like a lot of software or accessories just like to get you to buy this mm -hmm. other than an Apple. Like they would price it, Sort of competitively, but hey, you get this monitor. What brand is it? We don't know, but it's a monitor. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, they would cheap out and cut corners on cases and power supplies and whatever. Be it, you know, it was saving you money. And by the time you bought the machine and you called up their their phone line, uh, and the phone line was dead, well, they had you anyway. So. Right. It's, what what country was this machine made in, Steve? <laughs> it, it doesn't it exist anymore. This, it does not exist anymore. <laughs> Put it in H. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're going to skip around a little bit here, but like some of the, the first waves of these clone machines uh, were quite interesting. They, some of them still had uh, Nubus, uh, the older architecture and so on. Um, but like the, this great photo by Garth Beagle, who's in the audience here. Thank you. <laughs> <gasps> <laughs> well then, you'll be hearing from my attorney. Um, <laughs> 
the uh, the radius system here, which has a beautiful metal case, which I'm told to to tell everybody, um, and it's it's uh, it, it it will weigh down like multiple coffee tables. Like if if you if you don't want it to move during a hurricane, just put it on there. Um, but it was meant as a higher end station. Uh, they would put in their own uh, video card because Radius was a, a company that did a lot of accelerators, a lot of uh, stuff for uh, video editing and uh, photo mm -hmm. editing and stuff like that. And so they would basically make you like an editor's bundle. And they sold these mainly to professionals. They were like thousands and thousands of dollars. And they're very high end. Um, whereas very Power pretty. Com yeah, they're, they're very pretty, mm -hmm. but it's basically an 8100 logic board inside uh, with like mm -hmm. some slight modifications. Um, and then Power Computing was one of the other earlier ones, and uh, they had uh, desktops, they had slimline desktops, they had towers, and they changed their name every like six months of like the different models they had. It was like Power Wave, Power Base, this and that. So when you're Googling these things late at night, when you can't go to sleep tonight, um, there's a lot of differences between them, and it basically comes down to like the processor type and the architecture mm -hmm. they were using. Uh, some of the other ones that uh, will come out later, uh, so uh, Super Mac uh, was the brand uh, that would be later sold off and uh, UMAX would produce all these Macs. Uh, what was cool about these is they were pretty damn reliable. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we were joking a bit about like suspicious power supplies and stuff like that. And by and large, I mean, the clones worked. They were, there was a lot of these reviews in Macworld Magazine and they would like really put them to the test with these prototype units and like really push them like, oh, this is, you know, compatible with this. We didn't run into any issues with this, but if they did run into something, they would note it. Um, but it was one of those things where eventually people figured out like, oh, well, if I'm using that cheap modem I got that was included, it doesn't mm -hmm. really like, mm -hmm. I can't really download at uh, all these kilobytes per second. What's right. going on here? Or oh, error dash eleven. What's going on? You right. know, um, there was a yeah. point where software had to kind of catch up too for compatibility yeah. on things. Like you mentioned about the CD-ROM driver and things. Oh but, sure. But for a while, Apple was using enablers to basically say, like, yes, this specific machine with this Gestalt code is allowed to basically install the OS. And if you didn't have that original disk, sometimes it was really, really difficult to kind of reload a machine or get things back up and running, which caused a lot of confusion yeah. and, and grief for customers. So some of these, like you're saying about like kind of the consolidation of these other companies, really that was pro-consumer because oh, yeah. it allowed um, kind of some, uh, you know, middling sort of people to be like super middling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you could save two hundred dollars by buying our machine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> who knows where it comes from? But you know, yeah, who cares? Um, but uh, Motorola, one of the manufacturers of the processors, uh, they would actually have their own licensee uh, uh, for Mac clones. But what was interesting is some of these contracts allowed them to sublicense other companies. So like Motorola would sublicense to a company APS, which would make an M Power series of clones. And the logic board would be identical, but the case was slightly different. Get different software, different keyboard, mouse, or so on. You put it in more retail locations, try to... Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. it's like the the Konami Ultra Games of <laughs> try, trying to get things out into the market. Yeah, but um, although Apple had good intentions with the clone program, uh, the clone manufacturers found out very quickly that, hey, Apple is like getting such a high margin on these higher end, faster systems with, you know, better processors and RAM and accessories that like, hey, we, we just got to make a little bit of money here. We don't mm -hmm. we don't have the same margins Apple uh, needs to make to get by. We don't have that much staff and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah. And so they would really like have like cutthroat pricing versus Apple and versus other clone manufacturers. So a lot of the times if you were like a graphics designer and you had to buy a computer for yourself or whatever, you know, Apple's system would be like hundreds of dollars more, if not more than the clones of an applicable speed or the clones would actually have more expansion because they're like, well, we don't need you to buy the other one. You yeah. could just buy this. We don't care. You know, <laughs> and there was even sort of that point where advertising on these things took a shift oh, where because yeah. it very much before the clone licensees were just very much like, yeah, we're just kind of we're just little scrappy companies trying to do the thing. And then there was just a day that it happened that everybody's cojones dropped. <laughs> and they were just like, here's our machine, here's Apple's machine, our machine is this much less, buy our machine. Yeah. And yeah. it was like, and I think at that point, there was a big turn in kind of the relationship between the clone makers and Apple themselves too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Apple again was struggling at the time. They were also in like a billion different things, printer, scanners, mm -hmm. cameras, they were trying to do so much. Um, and they, they did try and impose like some restrictions or regulations, but it, it didn't really do anything at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, there, were, there were pushes to like sort of 
you know, have a, a better, more grand architecture for some of these logic boards and systems and have a more of a unified part that Apple could sell you a logic board so they make a little bit more money. But, you know, that, that wasn't a requirement. You know, mm -hmm. companies could, if they wanted to, manufacture their own thing with their, their own chips and make it a little bit faster or slower or whatever they wanted to do. And if you look in like a lot of the machines by Umax or Power Computing, it's oftentimes an identical logic board, but maybe the riser card is slightly different so you could fit more cards in there. Or they didn't have as many slots soldered on, so they could sell that slightly less. Yeah. Uh, so just some notable things here, Daystar Genesis made a, a dual and a quad processor Mac clone, uh, which was insane. I mean, not a lot of software was, uh, was taken advantage of uh, by those at the time, but this is very early days of that. Um, and UMAX and Power Computing eventually had dual processor systems too, because these, these companies didn't hold back. They didn't care. They just wanted you to buy the fastest machine possible. Who cares if none of your software is dual or quad processor compatible? Sure. Your system has it, damn it, and mm -hmm. it's bragging rights, and right. it gives us an extra a few hundred dollars. So, yeah, you it's, know. They've got dual, they got more quads, you know? They do that right here in the shop, you know, <laughs> do that TK421 modification and everybody loves it. So here, here are some of the ads that uh, Ron was talking to. Some of the more aggressive ones were from Power Computing. Let's kick Intel's ass. We're fighting mm -hmm. back for the Mac. And there was there was a lot of like Apple, like, no, you can't do this. You know, right. we're, we're, mm -hmm. and there's a I, I didn't find the ad here, but there's a Power Computing ad that says like we got caught for speeding or something like that. It's, it's a fantastic ad. Mm -hmm. And it was I think it was just as they were like closing down and they were just trying to liquidate their stock. And it was basically like Apple said we're too fast to buy our stuff. <laughs> but you would see these ads if you go look at Macworld or Mac User Magazine or any of those magazines from the time, you'll see these full page ads often in like the first few pages because they wanted to get everyone's attention and they would have all these benchmarks and stuff. So they're like, look, look how fast this machine is and look at the price. Yeah. And Plus, if you're a big fan oh. of, of <laughs> like Sluggo yes. and Nancy, oh my they're, God, yeah. oh, <laughs> million seller, million seller. So here, here are just some advertisements from that. Uh, they had uh, power computing, especially had a lot of shirts. I had a vest I was gonna bring. It's at home. I forgot, um, but it's a power computing one with dog tags and everything like that. And it's oh. I'll, I'll wear it in some dumb video. I'm sure at some point. Um, but these clones flooded the Macintosh market, and it, it was exciting for folks. Everybody who I spoke to when I bought a clone machine off of them, they were like, "Hey, it was something that was a bit cheaper, and you know, it got the job done, and I was able to spend more money on memory or a better monitor yeah, or something exactly. like that." I was able to finally get my kids braces. <laughs> so obviously, um, this didn't last too long. So when Steve Jobs returned to Apple, he axed the clone program. Uh, basically, the, the clone program was killing Apple. They were, I think they were only given Apple like $50 per sale or something like that. And Jobs tried to negotiate, and, and they basically told him no. Um, there was an attempt uh, to change a lot of the, the mindset of these clone manufacturers, but it, they, were, they just didn't care. They just like... We're making money, we, you, we signed these agreements, they're valid. And so how Apple said, okay, well, screw you. Um, the next release of the Mac OS was System 7.7, .7, they were gonna release it as. And Steve Jobs said, wait, all these contracts, they have System 7 in here. Right. We'll just change the name to Mac mm -hmm. OS 8. And oops, now all your, your licensing agreements are invalid for the next latest and greatest operating system. And uh, so come here and we'll renegotiate. And all of them went, nope, bye. Yeah. Uh, so only a few hung around uh, for a period of time. But that was like a, a real like, ooh, <laughs> this yeah. like type of a, a it was, situation the there. The thing was, is they, um, it's, it's a real Simpson situation with like Lisa <laughs> in the uh, beauty contest. And there was a bot. <laughs> that said do not write in this right in this box and homer put okay <laughs> and so there was like all these people got bounced kind of on a technicality yeah where they were just like well it doesn't say this exact thing yeah and pff, out yeah so officially um umax and power computing i think uh, power computing very late on got a mac os 8 license or they just like begged and pleaded but apple would actually buy out power computing so it's very weird for a time period if you go to the wayback machine and look at apple's website they had full support for power computing because they bought them out because they just wanted them to stop making them bleed so much because they were <laughs> relentless with their advertising and just uh, they they were just didn't didn't want you to buy anything else except mm -hmm. their machines so uh we'll, we'll go over some of this stuff quick briefly because we want to leave some time for q a um but just some things to know like some stuff you might see in a cool case it's not a mac clone they're often just like very specially built machines there's an apple logic board inside i mean it looks cool i'll, I'll buy one of these but you know it's it's not going to be like one of these power pc clones you think about um so clones you might pass by and uh, we'll get some heckles from the audience, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some very early systems that were like 
at, especially very early at the PowerPC era of things for Apple itself. And so these clone manufacturers are basically copying that. So you have these early 601 machines that are like, they look cool, but they're, they're kind of sluggish. Yeah. Absolutely. It's anything that was kind of based around that new bus power PC early days. Yeah. It, it was kind of coupled with the amount of code that was actually power PC native inside the operating system. And it, there was so much stuff that was just sort of like looking backwards instead yeah. of looking forwards. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they, they, they tried to, you know, shoehorn all these things into it. But at the end of the day, it was just the first generation of stuff. So, um, but the, I mean, like the UMAX C500, it's cute but it could be a little slow. 180 megahertz, I think, was the, yeah. the bottom line. And you only had two PCI expansion slots, so not too much. Um, power computing and UMAX, uh, I think, made some of the coolest ones. Uh, there's yeah. a, a Marathon Rack Mac, not necessarily a clone, but it looks so cool, I had to put it in there. Um, but they, they, I did think, uh, for a period of time, they did offer clone boards in those rack mount enclosures for people who needed you know, that, mm -hmm. that type of uh, server capability. Um, but a lot of these, you know, have better uh, system operating uh, operating system support for Mac OS 8. And what was great is they knew their demographic. They knew all the people that are buying this need the most power possible. Mm -hmm. So we're going to bundle in like a, a copy of Photoshop. We're going to bundle in, you know, this scanner that you're going to buy anyway or something like that. Yeah, there was a lot of VAR activity that kind of happened, a value-added resale yeah. uh, that happened with all that to just try to get every last dollar. Yeah, and there's, so there's like the, the Genesis, uh, which uh, Colin of this did not compute, and Sean of Action Retro did videos on, uh, which is now in my garage, so I have one of these to play with now. Um, but these were stupid expensive, heavy, mm -hmm. but they are super cool. I mean, it's basically a 9500 with multiple processors and, mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. funky plastics on it. Oh, yeah. um, and the power computing towers, again, lots of expandability. Uh, they just really differed on the type of slots that they had. And the Supermax, I mean, they're really neat. Um, some of them did offer dual processors. Even if you didn't buy it, you could just slot a uh, new processor into the uh, open bay there uh, later on. Um, and they use the same case as Dell Towers, except for the front. So if you if you have one that uh, is looking a little worse for wear, go get like a Dell Dimension, with like a Pentium 2 or a Pentium 3 in there. Mm -hmm. Just slap that in. If you're into that kind of thing. If you're into that kind of thing. Uh, this is cool. This is a Pioneer one. Uh, like, you know, these clones weren't everywhere, but they were also like UK exclusive or Japan exclusive models. Uh, this is a Pioneer one. It used Apple's own logic boards, but they put a heck of a sound system in there. Mm -hmm. and it's really cool. So, yeah, it's a, it's a 6100 and it's kind of bleh, but it sounds cool. So yeah, that's, absolutely. that gets you brownie points. And it, it has a matching laser disc player. So who doesn't yeah. like that? Uh, what could have been, we talked a little bit about this, uh, there were also plans for, uh, I think it was Motorola, where Power Computing had a, a G3, uh, what Apple would dub the G3 processor, right. that was basically like a super, super fast processor, and Apple's like, hey, no. Uh, yeah, we're keeping that for us, yeah. and, that was, and that was another one of those things that kind of helped decide for consumers that it was time to move on from the 601, 604, 603 yeah. machines, because the only way to get the latest, greatest stuff outside of what what really ended up being a very very expensive um, processor upgrade market yeah. was to buy a brand new machine. Yeah. So thank you for answering that. Um, so uh, yeah, just some of these cool things. Then there were like pie, pie in the sky stuff, like portables and dual architecture stuff. Was, oh, we could put a Pentium in there too, and you have the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was not to be. So. We're gonna open up for questions. Uh, here's... I wanna know your favorite before we move oh. this on. Well, it's obviously the listen, Pioneer. Listen, listen. <laughs> between you and me, since there's no mics on, I don't care what machines you like. I wanna know what machines you like. I like the Macintosh Portable. <laughs> I, I know you do. But if you were gonna get a clone machine, if you were at a show like this and you saw some clone ones, um, what would you specifically, like what's your, like, your pie in the sky one that you wanna get? I, I, I would love, I mean, I have one. That's why I paid stupid money for it. Uh, the UMAX with the dual processors. I just think that's mm -hmm. a great design with a little door that's always broken. But, you know, yeah. it's it, it's a pretty solid machine and has plenty of expandability. So you just fill that with all the silly stuff you want. Yeah, I, I, I would say that I also agree. The UMAX machine, machines are really, really nice. I think that that partnership benefited from a lot of learned um, mistakes yeah. that from the early clone program of like what worked, what didn't work. How do we get this um, out the door at the lowest price possible? How do we leverage some of the best elements of the P of the PC PCI era uh, Macintosh machines? Um, avoid those Motorola <laughs> Star Max machines, like the oh, clap. <laughs> that those soldered machines, on processors with buggy scuzzy buses. Yes, those machines are so <laughs> awful. And I bought one. I thought I wanted one. 
and it's like everybody that buys an MG. It's, <laughs> you know, you get in there and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I'm 6'8". What was I thinking? Even fresh restored from the CD that came with it, it like froze on boot up. So that's a yeah, good sign. It's, and they shoveled so much crap on those poor machines. Um, for I, I, It's just so terrible, so terrible. While, while Steve and I stall for time, if people would like to form a line right here at this microphone, if you have any kind of questions, we would love to answer them. There, for there you. may be an incentive for the first few people asking questions. There may be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sir, the bathroom's located in the other way, Carl. You can't. <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, what about the uh, Apple Pippin? Oh, yeah. So that's that's oh, yeah. not technically not an Apple product, but Bandai. Yeah, you know, Bandai, but, yeah. But uh, very <laughs> get thumbs up from the group. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very interesting product. Um, but it was, you know, something that, that was not meant to be a computer. It was meant to be like more of a multimedia thing. But it has the same spirit as a lot of this stuff. It also, you know, it cost Apple a lot of money and it didn't do too well. So, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, that was what I asked because I figured, oh, this is kind of related. So yeah. <laughs> I, I would avoid the Bandai Pippin and instead just watch the music. Musical Pippin, <laughs> because I am. It, it's two more hours of entertainment that you'll ever get with a Bandai product. So, if you, if you would like to come up to the front, we have a selection of mouse pads you could choose from. Yeah. Nice. Oop. So. As I flop them around. Yes, sir. Hello. Um, first of all, interesting. I enjoyed that. I, my dad worked in printing when this clone, you know, was my whole time I was a kid, mm -hmm. and uh, Power Tower Pro all the way back then. Yeah. Um, with that, though, like, they kept those machines longer than, they would upgrade machines every, like, six months, because when you're printing Montgomery Ward's catalogs, latest and greatest has to be done at all times. Your um, brand name savings store? <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they used to print them out here in Arlington Heights. Mm -hmm. All the catalogs for them. I, I, I worked for the Montgomery Ward Corporation for oh, many, no many kidding. years. Actually, for a long time, I was an Apple trainer and would go out to other stores and teach people how to sell Performa machines. I am so sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my question though is this, like those things were everywhere, those clones, especially the power computing ones, um, they, they had a ton of them, but nowadays you don't see them. Are, are they, did they break more? You can find them in the dumpster sometimes. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I just, you, you always see the old Mac stuff, but you never see the clones. And I don't know if, yeah. were they more I, I unreliable? Think, you know, people like, just real? hung on to them more. You yeah, know? But there were quite a few of them that were out there on the show floor. Power, uh, yep. power computing machines, there were a couple of UMAX machines. But yeah, you certainly don't see them as much because the, the program was so short lived and was very, very quickly replaced by um, other machines. And because of the design of them looking, many of them look more like PC clone machines, they just went to the great recycler in the sky. People didn't have nostalgia for those. And so now we have kind of a precious few left that um, still, I mean, just shred every Star Max that you can find. <laughs> it's fine. You're, you're actually, you're putting good in the universe by doing that. I think but, I did see one of those out there and laughed because there was yeah, one there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, also with the quad processors, just as a little tidbit, uh, one of the programs that did work with that was Illustrator and Photoshop, which mm -hmm. of course the printing industry used. The company my dad used to work for, which is long gone, they had three of them. Oh wow. The quad <laughs> processor machines. Nice. Those were a lot of fun. I'll take three, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. We have a mouse pad if you'd like one. Next question, please. We heard that the uh, Star Max is the one to avoid. I wanna hear what each of you would have to say about what is the Holy Grail clone to get? Or that well, you would like to get the, yeah. the day star is is like up there but any any of the umax or power computings if it's just the form factor if you think it looks cool that's the one to get i mean really mm -hmm. they're very similar in architecture they used a lot of the similar stuff but mm -hmm. um just avoid anything with a soldered on processor yeah if i'm just going to get a pie in the sky i would love to get a machine i would love to have an outbound notebook that's from just such a weird time yeah. and it's like these people were pirates <laughs> like just going out there and doing things and like skirting around all the rules to put something in the hands of consumers that were desperately wanting something but couldn't buy it. So I'd like to change my answer to that. Okay, so, <laughs> sweet. We have two mouse pads left yeah. and uh, any questions that uh, we're gonna get yelled at for taking uh, afterwards, we will meet you in the hallway. Great presentation yes. by the way, gentlemen. Thank you. Hey, well, nice thank to you. meet you for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, 
Can you tell everyone about how Apple actually did a little funny music video about the clones? Oh, yes. Thank you. Ron, if you will stand up and show everyone the back of your shirt. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I hope you have a good vision. <laughs> it says, I think we're a clone now. <laughs> if, if you Google that or YouTube it, you will get some surprising video results. There's a great marketing video they did. It's catchy. It will get in your head. You could guess what song it was parodying. <laughs> So uh, I had a uh, Motorola Star Max back in the day, um, and I loved it. It was my main Mac for like five years, and I never had any trouble with it. So I'm really curious to hear the story of why you hate it so much. <laughs> I think like, we overpaid. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, well, for me personally, it's... Um, Again, I, I, I kind of during that era, I had clients that um, like, especially lawyers that were just like, it's like, how can we save a little bit of money? Some people had power computing stuff, which was pretty good. But then a lot of them bought into the Star Max stuff. And it was just a support nightmare because, again, we were kind of waiting on the operating system to catch up. Uh, we were waiting on um, sort of the stability of the machines to catch up. And it was um, it was just kind of painful to work on. So I've got a lot of bad memories about it. I, I hear I hear they work better when you're using them though. So yes. mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe we just have a rotten thumb. Yes, absolutely. Veronica, would you like to explain what your question is? Um, so hi, my name is Veronica. I'm I'm with a band called the Stop Bits. And I, I this this is a question for Steve and Ron. Are you ready to rock? <laughs> yes. Because yes. if, if you're ready to rock, you should stick around. Yes. Because we're about to rock. Yes, Woo. I would. I would like to encourage everybody to stay exactly seated where you. The doors are. will now be locked right. for your audio pleasure. <laughs> if you would like to hear original music about vintage computers by four YouTubers, this is the best experience of that today. I'm That's just right. saying. Okay, thank you. I, no, I will take my question out of the line. No, it's fine. I. Is there a band playing today? <laughs> there is. <laughs> You're in the next convention center over, sir. Right. It's, yeah. So, again, everybody, thank you so much thank for you. spending time with us. Um, my friend here is Steve from Mac84. And Hello. if you liked uh, my part of the presentation, I'm Ron from Ron's Computer Videos. If uh, you didn't, uh, I'm Clint Bassinger from LGR. <laughs> everybody have a wonderful night. See you out in the show.